Good morning, everyone. I'm Allison Van Dyke. I'm the executive director of the Temple of Understanding. And I want to welcome you this morning to our Eco Justice for All dialogue program entitled Youth Voices on Climate from Religious and Spiritual Perspectives. This is a series of the Temple of Understanding, a 63 year old interfaith organization whose mission is to advocate for interfaith values in the secular setting of the United Nations as an NGO and around the world. Our focus for the past 12, 13 years has been to increase the awareness of religious leaders and actors of our climate crisis and its negative impacts on achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, in particular, peace, justice, women's health and safety, food sovereignty, and ecological regeneration. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our moderator, Madeline Canfield. And Madeline will introduce herself and the other speakers. Madeline, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elsa, for having us. It's so lovely to be here this morning. My name is Madeline. I use she, her pronouns. And I am a 21 year old climate activist, um, originally from Houston, Texas on Karankawa land. Um, and currently living as a student in Providence, Rhode Island on Narragansett land. I am the organizing coordinator at um, a climate and sustainability organization called Adama for its Jewish youth climate movement. I have been working there for nearly three years, um, working on organizing tactics, strategies, and um, actions related and policy related efforts to really mobilize our Jewish community in the United States to be a reliable central force mobilized within the climate movement of as understanding that this is a multi community effort in which we are trying to preserve our cultures for the sake of all communities and well beings throughout history so that's that's my work here and. Um, I am so excited to be joined by three incredible activists, as well as this really powerful organization. So I'll pass it to Ashna to introduce yourself next. Thanks, Madeline. Um, so I'm Ashna. I'm from the UK, which you could probably tell from my accent. Um, and I'm representing Hindu Climate Action. So we're kind of based remotely across the UK, but what we aim to do is engage with Hindu communities, across the country, um, engage with different temples and join interfaith initiatives to run campaigns, develop tools to just kind of inspire the Hindu community to take climate action. So we've been working, we've been up and running for about two and a half years now. So we're getting ourselves established, but it doesn't come without its challenges. But yeah, we're, we're kind of doing similar to Madeline's work in that we're really focusing on the religious aspect of the climate crisis and trying to drive action through that. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be in conversation. What about Ali? Hi, everyone. My name's Ali Tharp. My pronouns are she, her, and they, them. And I'm based in Austin, Texas, in the USA. And I work with Green Faith, which is a global grassroots multi-faith climate justice organization founded in New Jersey, USA. Um, but we have teams across the world. It's been really inspiring working at Green Faith for the past year on a global team with people in Indonesia, in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Germany, France, Brazil. And um, so that's been really inspiring. And my work has focused on supporting grassroots multi-faith climate justice work across the United States um, and then working in coalition with Frontline and other environmental partners through the People versus Fossil Fuels Coalition, supporting people of faith to um, show up in, in deep relationship, solidarity and partnership with people who are resisting fossil fuel infrastructure in their communities and bringing a faith and moral voice to why we need to phase out fossil fuels. So um, that's been really inspiring work. Um, personally, my faith community is the Unitarian Universalist Church. I go to a church here in Austin called Wildflower. And um, I also, um, I would say I'm the elder on this youth panel. This is probably my last youth panel. So I'm seeing it as as a moment to celebrate and and also you know acknowledge that I'm I'm at that cusp of moving into just being an adult <laughs> I'm 33 
um, and, you know, really, yeah, honored and grateful to, to be here. And um, I guess that's all I'll say for now. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I'll say I've had the pleasure of working with Ali on various green faith projects, and I'm sure we will be talking about fossil fuel finance as a, a collective in the next few minutes. So I'll pass it finally to Alethea to close us, close our introductions out. My name is Alethea Phillips. I'm from the Omaha Nation in Nebraska. I'm 23 years old. I work as the lead organizer with Native Youth Alliance. We're an intertribal organization uh, founded a little over 30 years ago um, with the original vision for um, cultural and religiously appropriate homes for children, um, which is something that we now see as uh, Iqbal is upheld um, is something that's very important. Um, until that time where we are able to open up um, multiple children's homes, um, we have been working on all issues that affect Indigenous youth. Um, and in recent years, that's been very prominently uh, the climate crisis. Um, I also work as the Indigenous Youth Initiative Program Director for Earth Guardians, where I train Indigenous youth on climate justice. It's so nice to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think you know now we're going to move into we have a few questions prepared, but this will be a pretty organic dialogue. We might uh, bounce between various speakers, but feel free to share a second time if your first time after your first time, you, one of us maybe have thought of something else. And so I, I want this to be a pretty natural space. We're all looking forward to talking with each other. I would like to start with the question of what your guiding spiritual or religious principle, what is a guiding religious or spiritual principle that motivates your climate focused work? Um, actually, Alethea, can we start with you since you closed us out? Wonderful. Um, so I think that's what's really important is uh, to understand that we are not separate from the earth. And I think that's um, the biggest spiritual um, connection that we have is, is our connection to the earth. Um, you know, once when I was younger, um, my dad was trying to explain this principle to someone and he said, well, I'm not related to any trees. And I thought, what a sad way to live. What a sad society to live in, that we have severed our spiritual connection from the earth. It is only in the ways that we sever that spiritual connection to our mother, to the lands, to the waters, that we are able to fall into the pitfalls of humanity, of the corruption of oil and gas and greed. And it is by that separation between the it is with that that we separate ourselves from nature. And now as we're going forward, we want a lot more um, indigenous knowledge in nature. You know, we see it in um, legal terms of um, honoring traditional knowledge, of honoring why the majority of the world's biodiversity is stewarded by indigenous people, um, of understanding that that right to nature is an indigenous value. Um, so I think when we talk about this, is it's a spiritual and religious connection to the nature and to our lands and to our waters that drive us to protect it. Thank you so much. Um, Ashna? Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to preface my conversation by saying that Hinduism is such a broad religion there's a lot of different sects within it and it's very difficult to kind of break it down to my specific sect so I'm going to talk about Hinduism more generally today um, and honestly there's so many principles that kind of drive me to take climate action um, I suppose some of the more basic ones are ahimsa which is the idea of non-violence um, the idea of girl now, which is the idea of compassion. So I think we all understand that in terms of climate justice, the climate crisis is causing a lot of impacts on different developing countries, people perhaps who are living in coastal areas and are 
pretty prone to natural disasters. And as Hindus, if you're showing compassion to everyone and all living beings, you should really consider that as one of your driving values and think about how you can help those communities to not only recover from those damages that they suffer, but also to um, mitigate the chances of them going through that suffering in the first place. So I'd say that's where my beliefs are probably rooted in. Um, I want to draw attention to one other guiding principle for me, which is a quote within the Upanishads, which is one of the main scriptures for Hindus, and it's one of the oldest scriptures as well. And there's a phrase in there which says, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which means the world is our family. And so I think that's really similar to what Alethea was saying and coming into with her um, references saying that we are part of nature and we are one with the earth. And so it's really important to think of the earth as the same thing as us. And so really look after it and protect it like you would your own family. It's really beautiful. Thank you so much. Ali? I resonate a lot with what's been said already. I think a you know um, spiritual principle of interconnectedness and relationship is a, a deep guiding um, truth for me. And beyond that, um, it's kind of funny with the Unitarian Universalist Church in the USA right now. We're actually revising the language we use around our faith principles. So it's in flux for our tradition right now, which is interesting. But I think it also points to something that we hold true in, in the UU, Unitarian Universalist tradition, which is um, a living faith, um, how it, that, that we need to evolve with the times. And um, also that, um, not only that, but that we need to live our values. We need to recognize that what we do matters and that we live in um, in accordance to our, our moral principles, our values. And I think that, um, yeah, that sense of embodying what we want to see in the world and, and then the truth that what we want to see is, is peace, is justice, is thriving for all living beings. Um, that's been a, a guiding principle for me. And um, when I was coming into like coming of age in this work, um, I was really digging into the climate crisis, but this interconnected mass extinction, like biological collapse that we're seeing on our planet um, of biomass of species going extinct at a rate a thousand times more than natural rates and um, feeling really deep grief and despair about that. And then seeing in research um, that basically what we do can affect the rate of species decline, like could be, you know, could be within a few hundred years, within a few generations, or it could be 10,000 years if we take this moment seriously. So that was actually, and, and one of the Unitarian Universalist principles is also drawing wisdom from science. <laughs> so we can see, you know, both through, through spiritual um, knowledge and through looking at science that what we do in this moment affects all of life around us and that we have a deep obligation to take that seriously and to live um, in accordance to that vision and value of building more peace, building more, you know, reciprocity and balance on our planet. Thank you so much, Ali, and for everybody. As, as Ali started to say, I will start with a moment of resonance. I think we've all shared very deeply kind of a sense of values and why peoples and power traditions teach us that peoples reside in community with other species, other communities of humans, other species, and just other life forms on earth, whether those are animate or not, and the need to like, understand fundamentally that connectivity. When thinking about my um, own Jewish community and in Judaism, I think of this question in two very linked ways, but it's kind of one as a sort of understanding of tradition and one as a sort of understanding of ideology. So in terms of tradition, we like to say at the organization I work for, and I think the Jewish community is having an environmental renaissance these days. So across many organizations and communities, um, the, the Judaism is in a land-based tradition. Fundamentally, we have a long history of environmentalism, even just like in contemporary environmental movements from the 70s, there was a lot of people who were moving to like create spiritual communities and were really hearkening back to the, tra the traditions of the land. So, for example, many Jewish 
holidays are tied to land practices and the seasons and just natural processes like the cycle of the moon and harvest. We have a lot of harvest holidays and the ability to like have certain elements of the earth, whether those are water or fire or kind of certain lands or produce, et cetera, is pretty integral to a lot of our traditions. And I do think uh, an interesting way of seeing this was a recent action that happened last October at BlackRock, which is an asset manager that is the biggest, they um, invest other people's money and they're the biggest asset manager investing in fossil fuels invest in the most out of any others and organizations like mine and particularly the, the visionary leadership of green faith are often out there protesting and my organization and me personally as a, an actions protest organizer I got to participate in a green faith interfaith mobilization in which one of the things that we did was feature a different tradition and communities or religion whatever you know we use different terms depending on who we are um, a different groups ritual that is based in some sort of in, um, land-based element. And so in the Jewish community, we got to feature water, but there are people featuring earth and air and um, land and fire, and it was beautiful. And then the other thing I think of is ideology. And I work for an organization called Adama. And in Hebrew, the word Adam kind of means like man or person. And it's the root of the term Adama. And Hebrew is a language that's very, very, very based in root words. So you take a few letters and you build off. Essentially, every word is built off of those some root. And it's all kind of linguistically connected. It's very intellectually interesting to study. But, you know, the term Adama means planet or land and so the very idea that we like to talk about in the climate crisis in climate justice movements which was that years ago people maybe weren't connecting the well-being of many populations of humans and human society to climate change there was a lot of rhetoric of let's save ice melting ice cops and polar bears which is vital but sometimes that was hard for people who were focused on how do I pay rent and how where am I getting mine you know next paycheck to focus not on the immediate issues of racism and many intersecting oppressions and capitalism and um, classism and intersecting oppressions. So seeing the fundamental interconnectedness is really important between humans and land. And my favorite such teaching or kind of like really ideological precept that's a framework for how we structure society is a something that comes from the Hebrew Bible, something called Shemitah, which is so old and it's this practice that every seven years you don't till the land, but it's not just that you don't harvest, it's that you free people who are in captivity, that you release debts, that you really reshape your whole economic and social order for the sake of collective-based justice. And to me, that's like a Jewish version of the Green New Deal in which we need to be tying housing justice, racial justice, um, gender justice, economic justice to climate justice, because we know all of our oppressions are interlinked and our systems are connected. So to me, it's really about preserving those traditions that are vulnerable to how do you have a harvest holiday or a spring holiday if your seasons are out of um, junction, out of correct functioning in the climate crisis, but also how do we allow our very diverse traditions, ideologies to be the framework for a non-extractivist, non-harmfully capitalist human society. So with that said, we've talked a lot about why we come to this work and how our communities give us moral and spiritual strength and kind of historical strength too. We, when you come from a faith tradition, you have the beauty of coming from something that is a lot longer and wiser than the current moment. And yet as an activist, and especially one who now works in a kind of community or faith-based group, but didn't originally, I came from a, a pretty secular climate movement for a long time. I often see that our work feels like it's stagnant or really difficult, but it's important to uplift when we achieve things. So I would like to ask some of you to share what you see as the strengths and successes of your work as an activist, particularly doing this from a religious lens. Um, let's start with Ali, who can start it. Sure. Um, well, I, one of my 
biggest moments was in March this past year. There's a one of the biggest oil and gas conferences in the world is in Houston, Texas. And I'm also, you know, kind of grew up in Texas and the heart of oil country, as they call it. And, um, you know, it, it's it's very hard to be an activist here um, against the fossil fuel industry. And um, I've been a part of groups doing this work since 2012. And so it was kind of a, a really significant moment to be able to disrupt a panel at this oil conference, Sarah Week in Houston. And um, we were, I was with, um, a small group of folks who did this, um, but we disrupted the CEO of Total Energies, which is the biggest exporter of LNG in the United States, and they also are the biggest party involved with the East African crude oil pipeline, where I have colleagues in Tanzania and Uganda and Kenya who are organizing to stop, you know, the the um, placement of ECOP, we call it, um, through a huge lake that's a, a sacred space and also a water supply for millions of people and um, a lot of human rights violations and injustices that have occurred in that part of the world from ECOP and, and Total's involvement there. And we also, I have colleagues as well in France who are organizing against them. So um, to do something that was able to connect with my partners and colleagues here in Texas resisting Total and their involvement in LNG exports, as well as communities in Africa and France. Um, you know, I, I basically, I, I stood up on a chair and I held up a banner that said, um, stop ECOP and stop um, Rio Grande LNG, which Total finally, um, they negotiated to be a, a major stakeholder in the Rio Grande LNG project in Brownsville, um, which is a, a major <laughs> concern and issue to the Carrizo Come Crudo tribe and the communities in that region. And, um, you know, I, I disrupted um, the CEO of Total and um, said my piece about why we needed to stop doing this. And then I sang a song and then was escorted out. And um, I had been trying to <laughs> disrupt business as usual at that specific conference for six years. And so to finally accomplish it was um, a major success um, personally, and also very, very gratifying to be able to support my um, international colleagues and communities as well. So I would say, yeah, that that's the moment that comes to mind for me. I'm sure there are others I could share, but I'll stop there. Thanks. I'm so proud to hear that as somebody who grew up in Houston, Texas, and that's where all of my organizing comes from originally when I was a teenager. I, I love to hear the story all the more. We had our youth groups there, um, our youth activist groups talked many, many times about doing such an action and I think did some in some form, but were never as disruptive. So I'm proud and next time you're disrupting in Texas, please let me know. I would love to be in solidarity. Um, Ashna, do you, would you like to share? Yeah, thank you. And that sounds amazing, Ali. Thank you for sharing. That's really inspirational. Um, I think none of us have been as disruptive and as powerful, but it's still the little things that can sometimes drive change. So for us, I know you mentioned BlackRock before, Madeline. In England, it's Barclays, I think, Barclays Bank, that is one of the largest investors into fossil fuels. And so we were supporting, we were actually working with a Buddhist organization um, to have a very peaceful protest. So no such disruptions, but we all gathered in Westminster to protest that. And that was just, for me, one of the strengths, not necessarily because of action. I mean, honestly, Barclays Bank is still gonna be investing into fossil fuels and, our actions didn't make much of a difference. But in fairness, the community and the connections and the networks that we made with our Buddhist colleagues were incredible. I have since uh, been collaborating with some of the colleagues there to work on some climate cafes for eco-anxiety, which I think is something that's really important to me um, as someone who's experienced eco-anxiety before. I think it's very easy for young people to experience some mental health issues in the face of the upcoming, well, the ongoing climate crisis. 
Um, and it, honestly, sometimes there's days where there's no good news and it just gets worse and worse and more damning. Um, and so the work that we did with climate cafes and eco-anxiety has really inspired me to kind of move forward and try and create more communities and smaller communities where we can openly discuss our experiences with eco-anxiety. Um, and I'd see that as a huge strength of our work because it's really allowed me to connect with other young people within the Hindu faith, faith but also outside of it um, and connect with a lot more people in my area who are working towards the same kind of things that I am and who come from shared ambition. Thank you so much. I definitely resonate with that question, the, the issue of sometimes the, the news gets more and more damning and it feels like we aren't moving forward. And also, I'll, I'll take a second and answer here. I think what you're sharing is that our work is a mixture of disrupting the dominant institutions by doing direct action, doing protest, being really disruptive and escalating and also creating community and going into communities and creating a space for people to not only be activists, but also to address their mental health, to address their climate anxiety and their grief, um, to feel strength in collective numbers and to like shared tradition and to hearken back to that those traditions and those precepts as a way of living in the present. So for me, a lot of the strengths and successes of my, my work um, in my organization and across the Jewish community, which has really, is that so many of us have really started to come together and be, I think a mobilized force in the climate movement, which is very exciting. There's still so much work to do, but increasingly the conversation is around why this is vital and how th this sort of traditionally rooted, religious rooted, religiously rooted and communally rooted work is so important to like what it means to be Jewish today. Many people in my community, many rabbis, like leaders of the communities have been getting arrested at protests, but also like many just young people are coming together to talk about these issues and feel connected together, whether they're planning protests and speaking and having a powerful voice or just at, like coming up with strategy to disrupt at BlackRock or at Chase Bank and other banks or protesting in front my group, you know, protested a a year ago in front of the White House in a really powerful action. And I think we've struggled to actually move our political and economic targets, but we have really successfully targeted our own public, our own community to stay, stand with us and be in this fight and feel roused and um, feel emotionally fulfilled by doing this work. Alicia, would you like to close us out? Yeah, it's amazing to hear about so many powerful youth-led actions. Um, and I think that's the one thing to really consider is uh, the fact that we gauge our success in a collective, um, that we gauge success as like a collective force, um, that we see ourselves as successful because we are powerful together. Um, and I think that is such an important message um, to learn from this. Um, you know, uh, for us, we've seen so many actions happen since Standing Rock has happened, that Indigenous youth are still very much at the forefront of the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, and so being able to see these actions happen as a collective and understand that power building as a collective um, is so crucial. Um, I think for me, one of the actions that we I was very proud of is um, this past November, we uh, reestablished a project that my parents had started 20 years ago. Um, so the last time I had done this, I was three years old. <laughs> Um, where we had stayed in a teepee in the, on the Washington Monument grounds for Native Americans' religious freedoms. Um, they did this for four years, um, from 1999 to 2003. Um, and this would be the entire month of November, 24-hour uh, teepee prayer vigil. Um, and so to see the beauty and having this come back 20 years later and understand this as a pivotal moment of how much progress we've made, but also understanding the ways in which a lot of the things are still the same. Um, and also being able to be there in a prayerful way. I think that's one thing that 
really made Standing Rock successful was being able to center that prayer at the heart of everything that we did. Um, so being able to be in a space where we can talk about climate change and also keep in line with our traditions without making that um, disconnection, as I was saying before. Um, I think that is absolutely incredible and it brings to attention how many indigenous people are out here are coming to DC um, and who were there. Um, and it was just an incredible opportunity to build community. And I think that's where real success lies. Thank you all for sharing. Um, it's so important to discuss our successes and I feel very inspired and empowered by these stories. And it's also important to discuss as we're always discussing in our own communities, but when we come together across communities as activists in solidarity and partnership with each other and with this temple of understanding and all of you as young interns doing this work to talk about the obstacles that we encounter when we are pushing for change, when we are organizing and when we are identifying as activists. I'm curious what obstacles you have all been encountering recently and how you how they have influenced how you show up to this work um we can start with Ali sure um I guess I'll by by conventional definitions um I've been in campaigns that have failed over and over and over again, more times than than I've been successful. You know, um, it's you know, there's just too many obstacles to name because we live in a society that is still um, you know reeling from centuries of colonization and imperialism and and the trauma that that has caused the rifts in our ability to collaborate across you know, ethnic, racial, cultural um, divides that have been like wedged by that um, violence and um, centuries of harm. So yeah, it's, it's like we're, we're swimming in really challenging waters, you know, and, and what we're really talking about is, is holistic cultural shift, holistic systemic changes in um, economic, political, and cultural systems that we find ourselves in so you know it, it's like a real um challenging path that we're on um you know so I um resonate with what we said before and you you know finding community as as like looking not if, if you look at what can I as an individual you know like like getting out of a headspace of like I'm gonna save the world is really important <laughs> it's like together we can change and transform um but letting go of you know um ego and, and and these kind of traditional norms of um what success and what failure is um and really holding true to that relationship with what is sacred with what is life and and how can we live in a good way um in balance so um yeah those are kind of big broad <laughs> topics maybe not as specific as I I could be in in specific obstacles I faced but um you know to maybe put a finer point on it for me it's been a lot of um navigating despair navigating the um the pressure that I have felt under in campaigning against mega corporations with so much more wealth and access to like political power the the pressure of that is hard um and for me personally in navigating that um to not break under that pressure um what i found was most um you know a, a source of resilience for me was to balance the work i did against extraction against you know this kind of death economy death system that I see and um also put my energy and my time and my activism into things that are building the world I want to see creating the change I want to see so I found that as like my um guiding <laughs> you know like um source of of strength and resilience 
And for me, it was going into also like each of us is unique in in our gifts and our passions and our calling. So like looking also at um, finding what brings me joy in life within this context of, you know, the activist ecosystem. And and I found that in um, working with food and community, bringing community together around food. And um, we have a public park here in Austin I volunteer with called Festival Beach Food Forest, where we grow fruit and nut trees, medicinal herbs, um, all kinds of like thousands of plants in this public parkland for the community to come and harvest from. So that was like a real concrete place where I could build the world I wanted to see where food was free and accessible and grown in common public spaces. And um, and it's, you know, for for a long time now, it's helped me to have the strength and resilience to continue um, challenging the fossil fuel industry um, by also um, doing something that's rooted in creating, you know, justice and, and peace and thriving in communities. So um, that was my antidote to, to despair and burnout was um, finding that balance and all of us need to really yeah look at our strengths and and the path in a way it's a path of least resistance right like what where are you actually compelled and called and excited um, and joyful to be doing this work within a really big monolithic you know crisis that we face um i think if all of us can move with that um alignment with you know um then then we're more likely to win, <laughs> you know? And then we're more likely to have a like a, um, like it's such an unfair burden for our generation that we're facing this, <laughs> you know, in this moment. And um, and we can't like forego <laughs> having a life, <laughs> having a, you know, meaningful path um, just because we're facing such terrible circumstances. Um, if we can find, thread the needle, find that sweet spot where we can also um, have joy, have purpose um, that isn't all just reacting to crisis, um, then I think we're more likely to win <laughs> and more likely to, to build that thriving world. We can't say, oh, let's, you know, forego that for our generation, for future generations. Let's try to do both at the same time. Thank you much, so much for sharing. Um, Alithia? Yeah, I think this is such an important question, um, especially right now. We're seeing a lot of policing um, at protests, and I do believe that this is really affecting the ways that we show up um, because you know, as we've seen with Standing Rock, ever since Standing Rock, is that the um, the violence and the extremities that people will go to to shut down climate justice protests is getting to be very extreme. Um, so I think that's something that's really affecting, you know, the way that we show up um, and making sure that we're here as a community for each other and keeping ourselves safe, um, especially as we're dealing with this in our community. Um, and then I think um, as Ali was saying, was there was two parts to that is one that we are working within a colonial system, a colonial framework um, that, you know, for a lot of um, indigenous youth and youth um, are, the system was not built for us. And I think that's the really important thing to look at is knowing that we are working within a system that is actively working against us. Um, so, you know, we see this a lot within all the different um, power systems that are in play into getting this work done. Um, the, the power systems that we're going up against, having vast amount more resources, uh, more support and more militaristic support. Um, so understanding that we are working in a very colonial framework. Um, I think the other thing to really keep in mind, as Ali was saying, is that your role as an activist, as an organizer, is going to change so much throughout your time organizing. Um, the focuses um, shift and develop, and we are constantly in this stage of growth. Um, and that's what we really need to be able to do in order to uh, survive in this 
and movement is uh, that opportunity uh, for growth. And Ashna. Thank you. Um, so I think also drawing on some of the points that Ali and Alethea made, I think it's really important to consider the huge corporations that we are working against and consider how they're all paid to turn up. They're all paid to be there every day, all day working to actively work against us. And I think a lot of organizations on the ground especially faith-based organizations are working on the kindness of others the donations and um the generosity of time resource as well and so i think it's really important to remember that and i, I and i can i can say it for hindu climate action we've definitely noticed that time resource is always such a limiting factor everyone in our team and there's only maybe seven or eight of us and everyone in our team is full-time workers, they are parents, they have families and some of them are studying and it's really difficult to balance that alongside everything that we're trying to do with Hindu Climate Action. So I think that that's something really important to remember um, and I'd love to hear if this is similar to other faith organizations but another thing that we find quite difficult is I guess making that shift of mindset that's been so um so solid and so kind of the norm for years and years i mean hinduism is so old and when we we can happily have conversations open and honest conversations with different hindu temples different hindu communities and say this is a conversation that we need to have and they will so many times come back to us and say but it's been fine for the past 300 years, 400 years. Why is it suddenly not okay to act this way now? And it's really difficult to, even for starters, get them to give us that space to talk to them and then to have them have a change in mindset and a complete shift in how they're acting all in the space of an hour's conversation can be really tricky. And so I think it's also that idea, and I think Ali, you mentioned it earlier about kind of renewing traditions and making sure that it's not it's 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 not outdated and making sure that it kind of our traditional faith beliefs link in with the troubles that we're facing in the modern world. Um, and I think that's one of our biggest challenges that we face at Hindu Climate Action. Thank you all so much for sharing. I think you've said all the majority of what I wanted to say. To say, to reiterate really quickly, one thing that isn't exactly an answer to the question, but I think a lot about, reminded by what Ashna was just saying about our traditions, is that it's not only that our traditions compel us to do this work, it's that we recognize that our traditions and our communities as religious and spiritual as extremely historic, extremely old, as Ashna was talking about, are themselves vulnerable to climate change and must be protected just as we protect human populations and just as we protect many species and populations of the earth and the land itself, whether living or not. And these traditions, they almost take on their own life and it's important to use them to communicate moral agency and moral outrage and moral necessity, but also to be fighting not with them as a tool, or not only with them as a tool, but as the thing that we are preserving. And yes, the system is up against us. The corporations are endowed with unconscionable quantities of power, and we are just people. I find that one of the biggest obstacles is just the climate movement is maybe a little... It, it, I was on a meeting with some organizers yesterday, and we were talking about an upcoming mass protest, and we were saying, you know, we don't really know how big it's going to be. The climate movement is struggling to turn out people in the last few years that the numbers that it was, say, like before COVID, before the 2020 presidential election, before a lot of things changed in our community. And so that has been an obstacle. And the conversation may be right now such that we have really entrenched climate, the climate crisis and climate justice as something that everyone is, many, many people are really talking about it's difficult in our activism to have so much collective strength. And 
yet that we continue to innovate and come up with ways because we know that regardless of how difficult it becomes, it is so important to one, have the fight, but also to see the fight as a sustaining force. We don't want to be burnt out and to exhaust people. And at the same time, you can take a lot of personal love and enrichment from doing this work. And then Ali was talking about mutual aid as a sort of thing, whether that's protest or whether that's community organizing or mutual aid, there are so many ways in which the, the actions that we do and the need to have some sort of response is important. Speaking of which, do you guys see young people in your areas rising up in numbers? And are, are young people really concerned and involved with climate awareness? And how, how might seeing people rising up give us hope as we grapple with these uncertainties? Um, I, Ashna, would you like to start? Yeah, yeah, can do. Um, so I think that generally our social media presence has helped us engage with a lot more young people as of recent. Um, and we're increasingly reached out to more and more young people wanting to join the movement, wanting to join our work, which is really, really powerful. And I'm enjoying kind of connecting with new young people. Um, I think also with climate concerns becoming more prominent on social media young people are a lot more alerted to it than ever before they're a lot more switched on to it they're more aware of net zero targets worldwide sustainable development goals and more and more people are actually interacting with governments and trying to drive that change than ever before um, while it does give me hope that these young people are really you know enthused and passionate about being involved it makes me worry slightly about the huge task that awaits them I mean I've experienced it and I think we can all experience we can share experiences of how daunting it can be um, but I think a lot of this conversation has been based around solidarity and the idea of community and how if we all stand together that things can be easier and I think that that's what gives me hope is the idea that young people can come together such as forums like this and so many more that happen worldwide where we can come together and actually make a difference and drive that action. Um, and I think especially in recent years post COVID, it's been really empowering to be able to connect with people all over the world. So I'm in London right now, I'm the only one in London right now, but it's really nice that I can be part of this conversation with all of you um, from all over the US and I think that that's something that else that is really driving the change is that young people are able to find people not only in their area, but also all over the country, all over the world. I think that's very interesting about not just local based, but intra, you know, international and intranational work of youth solidarity and we're seeing so many youth rising up across communities across locations and one thing i think about often doing you know religious work community-based work is that our communities become another form of what people talk about grassroots local organizing what it means to organize your community is a lot broader than just the neighborhood that you come from it's the neighborhood but it's also you know what national or ethnic or religious community that you come from, or it's even young people as a sort of collective identity that we all share and organizing young people wherever we live. And I think that's a powerful for me. One of the powerful things about it is that young people are some of the most animated and that they are recruited through a lot of different means. And so we can bypass the structures that sometimes are put in place by traditional local organizing when it's hard to find people that we can use social media and we can use schools and we can use youth communities and you know youth groups and things where communities engage young people and it's also these challenges exist and at the same time they are opportunities. Alithi would you like to share your insights as well? Yeah I think this is so important because we start talking about our area as not just like the people that are immediately around us um, but starting to reach out and use that technology um, and make connections with people who have the same uh, similar ideals and same drive into what we're doing and focusing um, on this protection of our Mother Earth. Um, 
I think it's really important. Like I know uh, some of our interns are over at the church center by the UN. Um, and after the last few years, I've been going to the United Nations Indigenous Peoples Permanent Forum. Um, and it really brings indigeneity into a global context um, and seeing the similarities um, between our cultures um, and also the differences, but still being able to come together um, jointly to work on these issues together. Um, so I think it's really important because there's so many incredible indigenous youth out here um, who are doing such incredible work. Um, I think it's really easy to feel isolated in what we're doing um, in this work um, really often. Um, so being able to understand that those youth are out there and that they are organizing um, is such an empowerful uh, thing to know. Uh, especially with the youth that I work with through my training, um, just coming to know them and the projects that they're working on and the diversity into what they're working on, whether it's land rights, water rights, um, people who are fighting for the protection of their salmon um, and fighting to protect their ecosystems, understanding that this is really hitting personally and it's hitting very close to home um, for a lot of indigenous communities. Um, so I definitely would say that, yes, the people that you're looking for are out there um, and being able to connect with them is an incredible thing. Thank you so much. And Ali? Yeah. There's so much I want to say. <laughs> um, I, I, I will say, yes, I think young people are rising up in growing numbers as as a millennial, when the youth climate strike movement really kicked off pre-COVID, it gave me a lot of like a lot of renewal um, and inspiration. And so there's even within young people, like the the next wave of young people um, helped me as still a somewhat young person to keep going. Um, and um, I say that really, really sincerely and seriously that. Um, you know, and I know a lot of elders feel the same, that there's um, real strength and inspiration and power in youth organizing um, despite COVID. And I think that was a really important thing to bring in the conversation, Madeline, is um, COVID has affected the success rates of nonviolent movements and the turnout rates of nonviolent movements across the world. And one of the primary researchers on nonviolent resistance is a um, a person named Erica Chenoweth, and she put out research about this. Um, I just put a link in, in the chat, but um, Erica Chenoweth's research is like really fundamental to a lot of like modern nonviolent resistance um, strategy, logic, you know, motivation in terms of turning out 3.5% of a population to overthrow um, unjust governments like that. That comes from her research. Um, so yeah, this is a recent study that was looking at the impacts of COVID on success rates of nonviolent movements. And I think it's helpful for those of us committed to this work to, to, to you know, take that seriously and really think about, okay, how do we recover from, from a global pandemic in um, creating safety and um, success of, of people coming out and, and being really creative. Like we're at a time where, um, people are losing faith in in the ability in 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 our ability to be successful. Um, so I think it it will take deep reflection, discernment, creativity, and courage, and um, commitment to to finding ways for people to accessibly be a part of what we're doing. And it's not all just going to look like turning out to a march, like, or turning out to a rally, we have to be creative and um, look at new models and, and, um, and again, build, build that world we want to see and have that be a through line with, with what we're doing. So I think that's, that's really important. And I think youth are um, doing a really good job at, at that, you know, at um, looking at creative ways for people to engage and social media being a part of it, right? As Ashna was saying, um, one piece of it. 
but there's there's two spe specific things on the horizon I wanted to bring up. Um, one is for my local area. There's a youth climate summit in mid July in the um, in Corpus Christi, Texas. So I see youth coming together next month um, here in the Texas region, and um, and then also part of my work has been organizing with people of faith as part of, including Madeline, we've been talking about this mobilization that's in the works for September. Um, and here's the, the website for this, but a march to end fossil fuels in New York City related to UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez's Climate Ambition Summit in mid-September. Um, and the call is to put pressure on President Biden and the Fridays for Future New York group has been one of the like real key stakeholders in um, in organizing this mass march that's being planned for September in New York. So I see youth um, being really strong leaders in the broader coalition of of the climate justice movement right now. And um, and again, it, it's um, bringing a lot of power, a lot of strength, and a lot of inspiration to all of us. And, and I also want to just share briefly the um, the youth runners who really kicked off the Standing Rock uprising in 2016. That was also such a powerful um, action that happened um, and deeply rooted in prayer, you know, and um, and here in Texas, we also have the the youth runners who helped start that movement in 2016 came down to Texas and worked with the youth of the Carrizo Comicrudo tribe of Texas. And they just a couple months ago did like a prayer run from point of extraction in the Permian Basin through their ancestral territories to the Gulf of Mexico, um, the point of um, that Rio Grande LNG export terminal and also SpaceX and this movement to colonize space is happening in their ancestral territories. So, um, yeah, I see strong, you know, First Nations youth leadership helping to inspire um, the work we're doing as well. Thank you much for, so much for sharing all of that. It's really, you know, speaking of the youth runners, but then all of the, the examples that, that you shared are so powerful and I think segue really nicely into these are an example of things that we as young people can do for climate justice and the, the question that we're going to use to just round us out in the next briefly couple of minutes before we open to Q&A is what is one thing that we encourage all young people to do in the name of climate awareness and supporting the well-being of our planet and it seems like Ali shared this youth summit in the Gulf of Mexico and in um, this upcoming March if you have anything else you're more than welcome to share and then Ashna and Alithia. I'll circle back to me. I'll I'll pass for now. Um, either one of you, Alethea, would you like to go? Yeah, um, I think this is so important um, because I think a lot of the youth who are watching this um, are already at a point of using their voices and really stepping up um, into making change. Um, but what I would say for that is to really question power systems, question what kind of power systems are in play into what you're organizing for, who's behind the pipelines, who's behind the oil and gas industry, and especially finance. Um, climate finance is so important because it's the money that we put in to our own banks that end up uh, financing the fossil fuel industry. Um, so I think that's something that I really encourage people to do is get to the heart of the power systems um, and start there. Um, and I think divestment um, and looking um, up a, tactics around divestment is a great way to start. And I think I can kind of segue on from that and kind of I think what I would just encourage is to keep on researching into the reasons why all of the work that you want to do is so important. Because I think that when you look into what you what what's going on in the world and what 
the changes that you want to make more and more, you become more and more passionate about it. And that will become a driving force that will make you want to, you know, take up all your spare time to do certain work or really go beyond what you thought might be possible in order to drive change. Um, for me, I feel really fortunate to have found my colleagues in Hindu Climate Action. I feel really honored to have the space where I'm able to reach more people than I would in my day-to-day -day life to actually talk about the intersectionality between my faith and environmental values and also um, consider ways in which I might drive change. But as a very kind of early stages of my activism, all I did was talk to my family and friends about it. I talked to my communities about it. I just tried to mention my beliefs as it came up in conversation and that's what really drove me to become passionate and realize what change was needed and try and think about what I might want to do to make that change and so that's the thing that I think is really important is just remembering why you want to make change because I think that will ignite passion and really make you move further. I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I agree. I, there's two things I really want to say. One is pulling from what Ashna just said and what I referenced earlier is, um, you know, don't lose yourself in in the weight of um, the crisis and trying to, you know, like, yes, follow that inspiration to do something about it. That's so important, um, but also honor who you are. And um, one resource that's been really inspiring and grounding for me in that is by a group called the Building Movement Project. And um, I just put the link in the chat, but it's a framework of a social change ecosystem. And it's based in the logic that each of us has different gifts and skills. And um, when when we honor and, and lean into those and all work together in different roles, then, then we move further and, and have more resilience and strength and diversity in the movement. So um, it's a really good tool for thinking, okay, what's my role? What's me, my unique personal um, you know, gift that I can bring into the work that that is um, needed and vital, you know, um, and it, it will look different for each of us in, in small ways. So that's one piece. Um, the other thing I want to share is re really speaking to people like me who grew up privileged um, and with, you know, um, yeah, class and, and you know, skin color <laughs> privilege in the world. Um, just to acknowledge and own that and speak to, to those of us um, who had that privilege, you know, um, we were systemically shielded from the realities of injustice. And, um, you know, so I, I know when I was a young person, I caused harm in movements because I didn't have deep understanding or relationships with anyone who wasn't um, privileged, you know, in a way. And so um, to um, do the work of realizing that and like trying to like peel away the blinders that have been put up for us by the injustices of the world, um, really doing, that's really important in your youth <laughs> to do is to um, to build relationship and and humility that you don't know at all and that you you were um, raised to shield you from realities of of deep um, injustice and um, so to take the time to really learn and really show up um, and put yourself in uncomfortable situations but um, try to be humble about that so I know that was a really important thing um, in my growth in in my ability to um, to show up in a good way for, for ju climate justice. Thank you all so much for sharing that. I'll say just, you know, we've heard about the way that we think about our role and place in society, we think about institutions, so we think about privilege and identity um, events. And I would say most practically, I always tell young people what you can do is, look, when there are moments of mass protest, it's really enticing to be swept up in it and, and go out into the streets. And so much of the work happens between those moments of mass protests, especially when they become increasingly sparse in terms of frequency. So all of our organizations are 
likely, I, you know, I, I can speak for most of them, I think, um, looking for members and have ways for people to plug in. And there are so many social movement organizations where you can have sustained effort. So being involved when you can, but also in a sort of official capacity in organizations is always an extremely meaningful and important and open way. And I think when I was just beginning organizing, I came in through mass movements, mass protest, and it seemed so difficult to actually enter into an organization. And when I actually started doing organizing with organizations, I realized how desperate we all are for people to be part of our group work and to be sustained members in organizations. If these groups want you. It's not, um, there is no barrier of entry. People want to be coming in and want to train you and to listen to your ideas and to be led by your work. And with all of that said, I just want to thank everyone one more time and open it up to, from my understanding, all of you interns have some questions for us. Hi, I'm Hypatia. I'm one of the interns with the Temple of Understanding. I just had a quick question. Um, so I wanted to maybe understand a little bit more like how you guys gain more recognition for the work that you guys do um, at your organizations. Um, especially with communities or individuals who are non-religious or don't have spiritual connections with any particular um, community, are you faced with like more successes or is it more of an obstacle? I would say that personally for my organization, since we are focused on mobilizing youth of our own Jewish community, it, it does limit the subset. And our, our theory behind it is that we it's kind of like the idea of organize your local group, your community for the sake of being really in, you know, bringing people into a movement and there are so many avenues. And when we find people who aren't of our community, we give them many resources to connect. I think most prominently, the non-religiously affiliated groups are the ones leading the climate movement. Um, and with that said, in my community, we run a really, really, really large gradient of whether people are religious or not or secular or however they identify. And for us, it's important to just build a space that has opportunities and understandings for everybody, regardless of whether they're religious practice or even just knowledge of this culture or tradition. And so that it's both a place to educate people about the culture that they come from, but also a place to honor many different ways of practicing or not practicing and to be in community kind of not with any source of hierarchy of practice but to take a lot of different types of wisdom because we know that you can gain so much wisdom from many cultures and religions and that it doesn't have to be just one thing I don't know how relevant that is to your question but I'm also curious what the other panelists have to say so anyone would like to jump in I would say similar in that I think the climate movement is dominated primarily by non-faith groups, but whenever we have people approach us asking for maybe the opportunity to get involved or the opportunity to have that platform to speak on, we have, so Hindu Climate Action in the UK are part of a wider organisation called Faith for the Climate, um, and that is joined by a lot of different other faiths, so if other people who want to get involved have particular faiths that are different to us that's absolutely fine we try and point them towards the more interfaith actions that we have going on um and i'd say when people don't have those secular uh, don't have those faith-based beliefs sorry um we tend to point them towards the more general climate movements that are ongoing um, there's quite a few big ones. I think Extinction Rebellion is a huge one in the UK, especially. Um, and we try and point them towards them because they have more, uh, I'd, say, I'd say more variety of places for them to fit and find their community that would really kind of focus on their beliefs and their values. Um, but with that said, there would be nothing wrong with them also joining our movement. We have no reason to exclude them from our conversation it's just important for them to understand that if they joined our conversation it would be very hindu based it would be faith based it would be interfaith based so it would be really underpinned by religious values or religious beliefs another piece i heard was how do you gain recognition um in your question 
and the main thing that comes to mind is just time, you know, um, showing up over time, you know, and not giving up or expecting that, that it'll be easy, <laughs> you know, um, but coming with um, curiosity and, um, and whatever strength and, you know, um, resilience to keep showing up you can find. I think that that's the main thing. And then, and then also like that piece of, um, I, I don't want to hammer too hard on this, but like, um, not trying to be something that you aren't, you know, like, um, finding, finding the way you can bring your unique gifts and skills into the work will help you shine. Yeah. Um, and I think what's really important about that is also, um, how you come into a group like that, and understanding the mutual respect that's needed for this. Um, I think Native American religion um, has also especially been really hit hard by colonization. Um, and, you know, we have um, Indigenous people who are, practice other faiths. Um, and, you know, some, some of that is the effect of colonization. Um, and so being able to recognize and understand that and still come in a respectful way and still be able to make those, to understand those relations, the, the, those relatives, um, and still come in a respectful way. As long as you're still embodying a lot of the values, um, I think is really important, um, but still recognizing that at least for us, Native American religion is a religion um, because that's something that, like you were saying, like recognition, that's something that people don't often want to recognize. Um, and especially as a climate justice organization, you know, we get that, again, that degree of separation between um, the spiritual, the spiritual severance of um, us in nature. Um, but I think some of those values and those principles um, are can still be embodied by people who are not necessarily practicing that particular faith. Thank you so much. I think we have another question coming up. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Willie Freeman. Uh, I'm a youth UN rep and climate advocate here at TOU. I first of all wanted to thank you all for being here and for your words. It's been really great hearing all of your valuable perspective on this. Um, I wanted to ask a question sort of based on your own advocacy and communication skills, as well as just general personal resilience. I wanted to ask, obviously, we're in the midst of so much chaos on these issues. And I think that many narratives sort of um, have this, you know, essence of despair, because the times are really tough, and things have become more bleak for many groups. I wanted to ask how you each personally find resilience and then also if you find um, that it's helpful to frame these issues with some tinge of optimism in your own advocacy with other people. Because I find that, you know, in my own experience, many people's eyes sort of glaze over as, as I'm communicating these very dark messages about possible futures. And I think that maybe many communities would benefit from a more optimistic or um, illustrative future with where where things work out and not everyone is doomed. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, so I think for me, something that I've learned throughout my time volunteering for Hindu Climate Action is that really understanding your audience is so important. I think a lot of audiences might benefit from a slightly more optimistic view, as you mentioned. Um, but it's important to not lose that realism either. Um, and I know that's not really answering the question, but it's really about finding that balance. Um, for me, I have an element of realism, but in order for me to carry on with my action, I really have to have that element of optimism in my own kind of drive to action and when I wake up in the morning I have to think okay I understand all of the doom and gloom that might be ahead of me in the future but I also understand how important it is to take action and to also have that positive outlook of I'm not the only one who feels this way I will um, connect with the community to work together to find a shared plan of action and 
to mobilize whole communities to work together. And so I think it's about balancing the realism versus the optimism, but also just working with others and connecting. And I know I mentioned earlier eco-anxiety very briefly, but I think understanding those mechanisms and tools that you can use to try and help you get out of the maybe burnout that you might be experiencing in activism or get through the mental health challenges that you might face is really important. And it's it's important to learn about your personal ways of resilience from that, I think. Sure, yeah, there, there's two things I want to share. Um, the first is a resource. So um, Yale has a program on climate change communication, and this is for people in the United States um, in particular, but they, they've kind of classified like six general categories of, of public perception on climate change. So they call this the six Americas, um, but it, six United States of America. So let me like classify that. But um, so there's different ways that they've found are more effective for communicating with audiences based on where they are on this spectrum of like acknowledgement and acceptance of the climate crisis. So it's you know, this is kind of a know your audience piece in terms of what, um, how framing is um, going to be more or less effective in moving them into caring and, and acting. So, so that's one piece of like communication strategy <laughs> resourcing that, that you could dig into. Um, the other piece I want to say is, is nuance and it's challenging, right? Which is that um, it's really important to question where you're putting your optimism and what the unintended consequences of that might be. Because um, a lot of people put optimism in technology to fix things because that's, we come from this technocratic, you know, um, wave and background. And, and that's kind of where our, um, where our society is heading is into like capitalistic techno solutions. And so a lot of people put hope and optimism there with unintended consequences of, you know, continuing to um, exacerbate environmental racism and environmental injustice in terms of where precious minerals for solar panels get mined and things like that. So, um, so I think it's really important to question where's your optimism, <laughs> what's the source of your optimism, and who's in your, when you think of who who you're protecting and preserving and, and surviving, um, you know, in your solution, who's included and who's invisibilized, um, you know, so not finding, just being, um, having a core ethic of um, social justice within your considerations about climate change. I think that's kind of a, um, I don't know quite what words to use here, but like a, a pitfall um, in terms of trying to find optimistic solutions is that um, some of those um, areas where, um, you know, broadly, <laughs> culturally, we're leaning on um, trying to find solutions that maybe are continuing to exacerbate sacrifice zones um, of entire communities of people um, or ecosystems. I totally agree with Ali and Ashna. I don't have much to add in the slightest. I just want to say really kind of briefly, Ali said something uh, earlier today that resonated with me a lot about kind of essentially the essence was building or modeling the world that you want to inhabit in the present. And I think I've been really thinking about that a lot in the last few months, my work, and I've been doing this for like five years. Um, this issue of Yes, the world of climate justice, this kind of a sustainable and equitable world for all, is um, displaced. It's the thing that we are striving for. It doesn't exist now. And yet I don't think that we always have to wait and to feel that we aren't there and we are only living in the doomed times for the sake of even some gleaming future that is possible. That if we show and model examples of that in the present, it not only will compel people to fight for that to be universalized and really um, entrenched as the norm in society, but also give people hope and like a sense of, you have to live today. We're not living in the future only, we're living in the current reality. And so if, you know, if we were talking about it from a religious perspective, if we model community cultures or senses of joy or just being together, and there are so many different ways that we can do this, I think that is another way that we can model that future in the present and show that part of it already exists. We're not just fighting for a vision that is elusive and 
entirely theoretical and visionary, so much of it exists in the here and now. And if we take the time to honor that, then we counter burnout and counter despair and fear and create hope and also joy of living in the present. Thank you so much for your answers. While we're waiting for the next person, I wish I could find, there's like a youth-led climate group that does Good News Tuesdays on Instagram. Does anyone else remember who this is? But I think that's, val it is valuable to celebrate our wins. I think that's really, you know, um, social movement wisdom is like, when you have a win, you better celebrate it because we don't win every day. Um, so I think that's another source of optimism that is really helpful. On that, I'd agree. I mean, in our newsletter, every month we have a section for just good news because it's all well and good talking about the doom and despair and the things that we need to do and the things that the growing list of things that need to change. But I think that kind of unique aspect of focusing on the positives is really good. Sorry, I see that our next intern's here. Hi, I'm Glennis. I'm one of the assistant directors for this year for the program. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, I'm not sure if you touched upon this, but my question was, how do you deal with opposition from people from your own faith or people who do not agree from the same religious um, group or organization? I think for me, that's something that I've battled with quite a lot. Um, as I said, we're a relatively new organization and we have faced quite a bit of challenge of people on our own faith and I think I mentioned about how a lot of people come back to us and use tradition and use traditional values as a way to say why are things changing um, and I think it's been really hard to actually change those opinions and quite often it hasn't worked and I'm really hoping that one of the other speakers has a more maybe positive outlook to say on this because I, I haven't found an answer to be honest and I'd love to hear other people's perceptions so for me it was really difficult especially when I first joined Hindu Climate Action is when I would go to different Hindu temples in the UK and I would be faced with a lot of challenge and a lot of people understanding sort of why it was important but not really understanding what it has to do with Hindu beliefs not really understanding why it was their problem um, and a lot of people kind of saying oh it, it's for the young people of the generation to deal with and I think that that's quite a common narrative especially um, as young activists I I'm sure we can all understand the pressure that's put on young people quite often in that it's a very this is a future problem and so it's for the children of the future to deal with um so i mean i guess i'm probably rambling now because i don't have an answer as to how i've dealt with the challenge but i just wanted to reassure anyone who kind of feels maybe a bit discouraged from that challenge to not feel discouraged because there will always be a handful of people who do agree and i'd also love to learn from the other panelists today one thing I notice a lot in my own community is less an aversion or resistance to narratives of climate action or, you know, climate change happening and the need for response is a lot of increasingly understanding and discussion and like a desire to be participating. And there's a big, so I work with the youth component, like program of my big organization and my bigger organization, and I get to help with this program, but uh, my bigger organization is the com is been advancing a multi-year project to get all the Jewish communities across the country to like write big climate action plans and decarbonize. And for me, the harder part sometimes comes from how do you get, say like in those climate action plans they're writing or in the organizing to get people to take really disruptive stances and to say, yes, we will disrupt our everyday activity to go into the streets or pro and protest. We will be protesting at banks. We will not just have a really cordial and nice meeting where we say, hey, Senator, please do this, but to be kind of escalating and agitating and disruptive and to say, no, the status quo and the whole system that we operate. And that includes things like capitalism and our financial institutions. That includes things like divesting money to get them to take those more transformational and radical and disruptive stances. That is what tends to be really hard in my community. And I think that what it, it happens is just kind of normalizing it, like starting more and more. And two, two kind of recommendations that I have and I've noticed would be one, 
amplifying young people and young people can give older people, uh, you know, more adults coverage because they have a certain moral authority and fire inherently. And especially in my community, a, like a reverence of like, you are the inheritors of tradition. This like, young people can take on some of that more radicality that others are more hesitant to. And then like, others follow the example and feel compelled to listen to their young people and to, to you know, take their actions as central. And then also getting community leaders, people like clergy and those who run institutions, if you find they are increasingly willing, increasingly willing to do things like go to protests and speak at protests and get arrested at protests and do the, and like talk about things like divestment and financial institutions and to do the more disruptive radical work, that also has a big impact on what others in the community feel compelled to do and to maybe to feel challenged to move out of their like inherently more unquestioning or respectable of systems notions. Yeah, um, I really appreciate what was said because, you know, I'm also in a similar um, framing of still trying to understand this for myself. Um, but what I found is that I don't necessarily get so much pushed back from people of the same faith. I think what it is, is overcoming a sense of spiritual superiority. Um, and I think uh, that's uh, kind of what we have to look inwards for is having that faith in ourselves um, and in grounding in our own faith um, and our strength and that, that we, um, don't get overshadowed by this concept of someone who is spiritually superior to yourself. Um, so I think having that in mind and having that grounding um, is really important in dealing with these kinds of topics. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say. Uh, quickly, I, I think it's important to have thick st skin here and realize you're not gonna change everyone's opinion. Um, secondly, I think being in relationship and coming with curiosity, the more they see you <laughs> moving and doing, if they feel connected to you and that they care about you, that actually has a lot of power to shift people and like get them to start questioning um, their beliefs a bit more. So, but thirdly, be strategic because you can't win over everyone. So like who is most important? in your life and in your position to be um, taking the time to have curiosity and openness and relationship with someone who doesn't necessarily align with you yet. And think about that with some um, strategy. Thank you, thank you for sharing. All right, I think we are out of time and that I'm passing it back off for closing out for Allison to, to thank you us. Yes, thank you all so much. This has been a great discussion. I've really enjoyed all of the questions also from our interns. And I uh, I just wanted to say that this is part one of youth being presenting, you know, their own organizations and youth presenting their faith traditions. Part two is more of a uh, youth program on activism. And we have um, zero hour Fridays uh, for future um, youth versus apocalypse group speaking. So they're they're not coming specifically from religious tradition. And then the other thing I just want to add is that the interfaith movement is not just about religious traditions. We also have a lot of atheists in our group, a lot of people who consider the, themselves uh, religious naturalists, which means that the natural world is their religion, their spirituality. So uh, the interfaith movement is a, a very wide and open and broad perspective on these, these all of these subjects. And I thought you all did a wonderful job answering the questions and also bringing up a lot of really important issues. So our next program is at the end of our internship, which is July 24th, <laughs> July 24th, uh, about the same time in the morning. So. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for participating and um, keep up the good work. Take care. Mm -hmm.